Welcome aboard, shipmates. This is Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories, a training program created for the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps by our supporters and friends at the Navy Talent Acquisition Group in Philadelphia. I'm your host, Warren Officer David Sheets of the Naval Sea Cadet Corps. I am joined once again by my all Navy support crew of MC1 Quinlan, who's our PAO, and STG1 Lewison, who's our technical support director. Today's topic, life on a Navy nuclear submarine. And it will be presented by our guest, Petty Officer First Class, Josh Mayo. Cadets, this is an interactive presentation, just like all of our presentations. So if you have comments, and I hope that you do, and questions, put them in the comments section of the feed, and we'll get them read out, and we'll get your questions answered. Also, as far as the online quizzes go, I've changed the online quizzes a bit. So therefore, once you take them, you'll get instantaneous results of how you did. You'll also receive an email and do something with that email with the instructions, like forward it on to your commanding officers so they know how well you've done so that you can get your two hours of virtual drills credit. So quizzes are a little bit different, still get them done. And the directions for the quiz and the URL for the quiz will be posted after the live feed is over. So without any further delay, Petty Officer Mayo, this ship is all yours. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Machinist Mate First Class, Petty Officer uh, Joshua Mayo, and I am a nuclear machinist mate. I uh, worked on submarines for uh, about seven years, uh, so pretty experienced with those things. Um, so if you go to the next slide, my introduction stuff. All right, so uh, I'm from Fuquay Marina, North Carolina. Don't worry that you can't pronounce it. No one can. Um, it's a small town right outside of Raleigh. I've been in the Navy for about 14 years now. And the reason I joined the Navy is because I was going to college at NC State. I was doing material science engineering. And I got to the classes that related to my major and decided that it wasn't as interesting as I thought it was going to be. Um, to be perfectly when honest, you were, I was, when you were doing that at NC State, right, and you came to that conclusion, yes. how come the Navy and not some other branch? Well, um, honestly, I didn't want to get shot at, so I knew I wasn't interested in the Marines or the Army. Okay. And I uh, looked at the Air Force and I looked at the Navy, and the Navy offered me a really big signing bonus. They offered me advanced pay grade, and they offered me the opportunity to travel a lot, and the Air Force didn't really offer me any of that stuff, so it made the decision pretty easy for me. Did you have any family that was prior military? I did. Um, my dad was in the Army, and uh, he got out, and then he joined the Navy. Okay. Uh, and then my uncle was in the Navy. And I had another uncle that was in the Air Force. Okay. All right. So you had you had a, a military, at least background family that probably talked about it from time to time, right? Did that, did, did that influence your decision at all? Oh, uh, yeah, it, it kind of did. Um, like when I was real little, I, you know, like every kid wanted to be my dad when I grew up. So at first I wanted to be in the Army. Uh, and then I, like I said, as I got older and getting shot at sounded less appealing, the, the Navy side of his military experience sounded more appealing to me. Okay. Um, so, yeah, pretty much um, that, that was a big influence. And then as I got older and going to high school, um, kind of a, you know, a humble brag here, but it, it was like a gifted and talented school, magnet school, and... Everybody goes to college. Um, right. And so at that point in my life, that's all I thought I was going to do is I was going to go to college and I was going to become an engineer and I was going to get a job and, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and then when I got to college, I was pretty burned out on school already, honestly. And when I got to the classes that dealt with my major and it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, I just kind of got discouraged and honestly was kind of an immature 20 year old and decided to not go to class because I thought it was boring. Right. Um, 
and it turned out that wasn't really the right call, so I uh, <laughs> lost my scholarship. <laughs> uh, right. Lost my scholarship and had to figure out what I was going to do. And that's when the military kind of came back into my my thinking because I knew I could get a job where they would pay me pretty decently. They give me a place to live, healthcare, food, all that stuff. Uh, and I didn't need a, a bachelor's degree to do it. So okay, very nice. So it it seemed like a really great choice at that point. Yeah, uh, it it definitely kind of the, the stars aligned, so to speak. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, so the best thing about my job, um, there's a lot of good things, but probably the single best thing is I love learning new things and there's so much information out there. Uh, I always have new things to learn and new challenges, new qualifications, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, Top Navy memory, again, there have been a lot of good memories over the years. I've made a lot of friends, gone to a lot of cool places. But my my first foreign port that I went to, uh, which was Bergen, Norway, um, it's, it's going to be hard to you know ever top that, I guess. Um, Say, just, I haven't been there personally, so what what is, what is the appeal of Bergen, Norway? So... Part of it was just because it was my first foreign port, but okay. a lot of it is um, the the countryside is beautiful there. Like uh, the mountains come right up to the ocean, um, and what they call fjords. Okay. So in Bergen, there was like this cable car that you could ride up to the top of the mountain that overlooks the, the harbor that the city is built around, and you know look down from the top of the mountain over the ocean, and you know it was really pretty there. Um, the girls were pretty there. Um, it's always a plus. They, yeah, always, always a nice bonus. Um, they spoke English very well. Um, I hardly ran into anyone who I couldn't communicate with. Um, so, you know, that, that was some of the reasons I liked it. Uh, the food was good. So, oh, good. A, lot of, a lot of good things there. Okay, great. So then you're you're stationed on quite a few uh, submarines and other ships here. So I'm kind of interested in regards to your submarine duty, but then also the USS Iwo Jima. Huh? That is not a nuclear attack submarine. So uh, it is. no. So what, what's going on with that? All right. So once I finished nuke school and everything, uh, I got stationed on the Missouri, which at the time was PCU Missouri, uh, not USS. Okay. Uh, because it was still being built. So um, when I got there, there was the forward half of the engine room and the reactor compartment, and that was it. Uh, there was no forward half of the ship. There was no back half of the engine room. Um, so they sent some of us uh, onto another uh, go on a ride, basically, on another submarine to get qualified and get some operational experience. Okay. So, um, honestly, it kind of was um, make your own fate sort of thing. I had a friend who was on the Miami, and they were getting ready to go on deployment. And he had been talking about how they were short on uh, ELTs, which is my specialization as a new, uh, which I'll, you know, tell everybody about it a little later but uh they, they were short they needed extras and my command was looking for places to send people so basically at my command i kind of said hey the miami is looking for people and at his command he said hey the missouri is looking to send people and so my command started thinking like okay he's definitely going on the, the miami and the miami started thinking okay we're definitely getting this guy from the missouri Okay. And it finally got to be like a week before deployment, and both ships are calling the squadron, like, hey, where's this guy's orders? And the squadron's like, we have no idea what you're talking about, but okay, we'll make them. <laughs> oh, so, interesting. Yeah, uh, basically, me and him just kind of made it happen inadvertently. Um, so I went on deployment with them. That's when I went to Norway. Um, I went to Scotland, 
England and France on that trip and whatnot. Uh, then, you know, kind of flash forward to the end of my time on the Missouri. I went to shore duty at the Nuclear Regional Maintenance Depot in London, Connecticut. Okay. Um, and while I was there, I had a medical problem that ended up getting me disqualified from submarines and nuclear power. Okay. So, uh, when I transferred to my next ship, I was now a conventional MM uh, of the surface variety. So, that's how I ended up on the Iwo Jima. Okay, that all makes sense. Great. So, I do have a question for you. It's more of kind of a, a, a technical discussion right now. Do you have a, like a microphone or something you can use on your cell phone? Because we're really having a hard time hearing you well. Um, do you have I'm a sure headset? That, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have headset in right now. Let me... Is this better? That is so much better. It's ridiculously better. <laughs> All right. Did we lose you? Fear not, cadets. Okay. Uh, so I don't know how I inadvertently ended up hanging up as part of switching over to this. No the audio is much better. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Great. Okay. Gotcha. All right. All right. Uh, unless there's any more questions from this slide, I'm ready for the next one. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Next slide, please. All right. So little quick uh, history about nuclear power. Um, Admiral Rickover, who us nukes affectionately refer to as dad, uh, is basically the father of nuclear power. And he was a very interesting man. Uh, he was very, very, very smart, but also a not so much people person. And so he had this great idea, why don't we take nuclear reactors and put them on submarines so that they can go and stay underwater for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And people thought he was crazy because in the 1940s, when he originally had this idea, they had just made the first nuclear reactor uh, called the Chicago Pile because it was a pile of radioactive bricks under the bleachers at the University of Chicago's football stadium. So people were pretty skeptical that they would be able to make that work. And, uh, you know, he proved him wrong. He was, like I said, a brilliant man, and he did all kinds of things. Um, he apparently went to Congress and drank reactor coolant in front of Congress to show how safe nuclear power was. Um, oh, they what? Wouldn't, <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, uh, nice. they, they wouldn't authorize him um, money in the congressional budget to buy the material that control rods were made out of. Mm -hmm. So they um, ended up, uh, he designed a new reactor that didn't require control rods. And um, yeah, it was uh, definitely, definitely a very smart, very ingenuity uh kind of guy but also not a very not a very nice man right yeah my my understanding hearing stories about him is that he was highly selective of people that were involved in the nuclear program and he would i i wouldn't call it psychological torture but not <laughs> far from that in order to pick out submarine captains and officers and even senior mm -hmm. enlisted folks so you know, if you just cadets, just look at this guy, take a good look at his face. He doesn't play around, right? Um, but because of his persistence, uh, nuclear power in the Navy, in particular in the submarine fleet, is you know an incredibly safe thing. Um, and it's only because of his insistence upon it and making sure that only the best were involved with it. So anyone that has uh, he was wearing dolphins or part of the nuclear core, you know, the submarines. Um, 
that there is a pride there because they've really earned those. Yeah, um, just as an example of how, you know, like harsh he was, uh, there's a famous story. It's actually uh, posted on the wall in um, the, the room where we graduate when we were done with our A school. And it is um, President Carter was a naval nuclear officer before he became president. Mm -hmm. And at that time, when Rickover was still in charge, every single nuclear officer had to do an interview with him. So, uh, you know, then Ensign Carter walks into the office and, um, you know, the, um, the admiral sitting at his desk and asks him, uh, you know, so I hear that you did pretty well at the academy. And, you know, President Carter's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I did did great. I was like second in my class, you know, starts going off on his list of accomplishments at the academy, thinking like, okay, yeah, this is like a softball interview. And uh, he lets him finish. And then Admiral Rickover asks him, uh, so you were second in your class. Why weren't you first? And, you know, uh, Carter sits there thinking to himself, you know, I don't know. And he's like, did you always do your best? And he, th he thinks about it. He's like, yeah, I did my best. And he's like, no, I mean, there were times when I could have done better. So finally he says, no, sir. Uh, you know, there, there were times that I could have tried harder. Uh, I, I didn't always do my best. And Admiral Rickover just said, why not? And like turned his chair around like some sort of like evil scientist or something like villain and uh, ended the interview there. Um, so he was very strict with his uh personnel choices well that 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 pretty much destroys an ego yeah yeah but you know president carter did end up being a nuclear submarine officer so it worked out eventually but right. he definitely learned some humility that's for sure Mm-hmm. yeah so um like i said admiral rickover we owe a lot to him but he was not a not a nice guy <laughs> right Fair enough. Um, next slide, please. All right. So um, why do we even bother with nuclear power? Why don't we just do what they did for a long time before nuclear power was even invented and keep using diesel fuel? Well, nuclear uh, power has a lot more energy. Um, you can look, uh, I, I don't know if you're able to see it on there, but there's about 76 million uh, megajoules per kilogram of uranium. And the gasoline in your car, for comparison, is 46 uh, megajoules per kilogram. So basically what this is getting at is you can um, run for a very long time without refueling when you use nuclear power. The submarines that I was on, Virginia class submarines, are designed to last 33 years before they need to refuel. So that's why. And yeah, what, what's always fascinated me with with you know submarines and, and cadets, just think about this a little bit. Think about how much power and energy it takes for you to swim a, a long distance underwater, right? There's all that force in front of you. And it's just your body, right? And it takes, and you may not even make it halfway across the pool and think of how exhausted you are, right? There's so much energy it takes to move something. Now, take something the size of a submarine, sh make, you know, gigantic as far as weight with all that power to shove it through the ocean with all, even more resistance and force. And it just cruises along like it's no big deal. Um, I, I'm sorry, but if you're really into the hot rod cars and NASCAR and all that type of stuff, that's that's kind of nothing compared to one of these bad boys. Do you agree, Pedro Romeo? I do. Actually, that was uh, probably my favorite Navy commercial ever. Uh, sometime, I think it was in the 90s, they had a commercial where it has this like black sports car driving down a curvy mountain road, and it's talking about 180,000 horsepower and all this stuff. And you think that they're talking about the car, and then it cuts to... Uh, 
Los Angeles class attack submarine cruising through the water mm -hmm. and the guy driving the submarine in there. And that's what they were talking about, you know, 180,000 horsepower. So <laughs> not, uh, not much to, you know, complain about there. <laughs> nice. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so that's about it for this slide. If we go to the next one. And this is a video um, that we're going to play for the, uh, I think it was on the USS Florida, which is a different type of submarine than I was on, but it gives you an idea of what submarines are like. That doesn't seem so bad. It's still out there. <laughs> There's a cat there. Yeah, it doesn't look like any submarine yeah, I've been on. Pretty cool. Yeah. We have Apologies, we have a commercial going on. Find your all-wheel drive. A video. I'm gonna run grab my charger real quick because I'm getting low on battery. Okay. And no payment for 90 days. Apologies for this. We're not endorsing any Mazdas or anything like that. It's just part of the YouTube. Approach the USS Florida in the Eastern Mediterranean as it prepares for a highly classified mission. So this is 18,000 tons we're looking 18, at. 18,000 tons of American steel. A nuclear-powered U.S. Navy guided missile submarine, 160 crew on board. They call it the silent service for a reason. That's right. All those missions are some of the most highly classified that we do. They deploy underwater for up to 120 days, several months at a time. We are given rare access as we board the submarine. Sure, Thank you. Sir. Rear Admiral William Houston describes where we are standing, just above the Tomahawk missiles. This can lift up at any time. This could lift up at any time on order if we wanted to launch the Tomahawk missiles. And how many Tomahawks are we sort of standing on right here? Right now, seven. They have more than 100 Tomahawks at the ready, and he points out something else. We won't go any further, but you're literally standing 10 to 20 feet from an operational nuclear reactor right now. They are about to take us down into the submarine where we will spend the next 24 hours traveling with them. A maze of narrow hallways and hatches. Hi, hey. how are you? Good to see you. Every inch of the submarine is used. They give me a harness. Your head's gonna go right in between there. As we prepare to climb to the top of the sub, to the bridge, we wait for word. Control bridge, send ABC to the bridge. Up the ladder through several hatches, they tell you when it comes to your hands and your feet, Make sure three out of four are touching at all times. We climb several floors to meet the captain and members of his crew waiting atop the USS Florida. We make it to the bridge where we find they are on patrol as the submarine leaves port, preparing to descend into the sea. Back down inside the submarine, Captain Seth Burton takes us past the missile tubes holding the tomahawks. So inside this tube right here are seven missiles. Seven tomahawk missiles. Right. And we take note that in between the curtains drawn where the sailors sleep. So the sailors are actually sleep there in between the tomahawk right. missiles. Right. Inside the submarine control room, they are about to deliver the order to descend. Submerge the ship, dive I. Dive, dive. <laughs> A camera shows the submarine disappearing under the water's surface. Water feet. Eventually descending 400, 500, more than 600 okay. feet beneath the surface of the sea. They train to move the submarine as carefully and as quickly as possible. 13 degree up angle. Soon we are all leaning with no effort. Pull up point. It is precision work in these waters of the Eastern Mediterranean. Not long after, we are leaning in the other direction. I mean, this is a 20 degree lean, right? Yes. Sir. As they pull back, they have to be ready to make these moves. There are others here too. We put the submarine right in this eastern portion of the Mediterranean to counterbalance the Russia buildup in Syria. Do you have company here in the Mediterranean? Uh, we do have plenty of company. The Russians are very active and uh, we're active with them. Rich Elm has you 270 to the left. The U.S. aware the Russians are trying to send a message. The Russians have demonstrated their willingness to use missiles from submarines. They did it from the Black Sea yes. into Syria, and, and now the Russians are here in the Mediterranean. They absolutely are. And we're watching them very, very closely. You so, are? Yeah. There's really not a day where we're not watching them every single day. Are they watching us? 
Um, I think they'd like to watch us. It's just the Russians recently showing their underwater missile in the Barents Sea. And just days ago, testing their new sea-based ballistic missile. That's not lost on anyone, what we've seen from the Russians in just the last week and a half. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons why we're here. At night, we watch as they use a periscope with an infrared camera above the water. Initial search complete, hold no contacts. Uh, so we're alone. We're alone. alone, nobody's there, which is good. We crawl through another hatch and snake our way to the nuclear reactor. Coming through. And soon we are standing in front of the hatch. They have sealed off. We're basically traveling on the submarine with a nuclear reactor. Absolutely. We can operate more than 90 to 120 days submerged. And the reason is because that reactor gives us all the power we need. And we ask, who is behind the hatch? The team back there is about 11 watchstanders, highly trained nuclear operators. And this submarine has only been refueled once. Only once. And that nuclear power also produces oxygen on board while under the sea. We are taken to the room where they monitor it all. When you're five or 600 feet below the surface, you got to use the resource you have, which is water. Right. If we're breaking down demineralized water into oxygen and hydrogen, so if we make approximately twice as much hydrogen as we do oxygen, we then send that hydrogen overboard. When it hits the electricity here, it breaks it to, into hydrogen and into oxygen. Exactly. Yes, sir. And there is something else about the USS Florida. It is always ready for U.S. Special Forces or Navy SEALs, their weapons already on board. We are about to climb to see the small compartment attached to the top of the submarine where Navy SEALs, U.S. Special Forces would deploy right into the water. Keep in mind that the submarine is still hundreds of feet beneath the sea. This is the dry deck shelter on top of the submarine. In fact, we're still about 200 feet beneath the surface of the Mediterranean here uh, in this room. This is where the Navy SEALs would deploy and a Navy SEAL a delivery vehicle of some sort. And in fact, the only thing separating me from the intense pressure of the water is this black hatch. And in fact, if you listen, you can actually hear the water. And on board, there is one more powerful weapon the torpedo. Because as, as a captain, you always want to be ready. And uh, so this one here is right. They have eight of them on board this submarine. One of them already marked Warshock loaded. And it turns out that every one of these torpedoes is tested multiple times before it's put into place on a guided missile submarine. These torpedoes were shot five times successfully as an exercise torpedo. The engine compartment, the after body and the forward nose group, the guidance control group of the weapon before it can be certified to carry a war shot. So these weapons have actually had runtime. Petty Officer Isamar Drake conducts a test run of the tube itself. Shooting two four. So the force that was getting released in there was the 2,000 pounds of air going in through the firing valve into the turbine injection, which is pretty much like a jet engine spinning it up, which just ejects it out like a giant water cannon. We have torpedoes that will basically uh, eliminate any submarine or surface ship if needed. If needed. If needed. Captain Burton is the commanding officer of the USS Florida. If you just look at the region. Pretty intense stuff. Yeah, definitely with our, our missions, we do all kinds of sneaky stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow, all right. And and then to qualify uh, for your dolphins, you need to, regardless of your particular rate, you need to understand all of that, right? So yes, cadets, we've talked a lot about submarine duty in, in this in this program now that you've kind of walked through that i don't know if you've seen this video or not but you know there is a lot going on here and you really got to know your stuff so uh excellent well done yeah so um like the warrant officer was saying we part of our submarine qualifications is we have to learn about every system on board the the ship uh the submarine and you need to be able to understand how it works, why we have it, all those kinds of things about everything. So if you were coming to me to get a signature on the um, reactor, this is something that you would have to be able to draw is 
how the system is connected, how it works. And then you would have to be able to explain information about it. So if uh, a young uh, person you just checked in, uh, they're working on their balls, the way it works is they're going to study. They're going to look at a diagram like this, and they're going to read um, the tech manual and learn about it. And then they're going to go to a qualified person, such as myself, and say, hey, do you have time for a checkout on the reactor coolant system? And I'll be like, yeah, sure, why not? And I will first have them draw the system, and then I'll ask them questions about it until I'm satisfied that they know enough about it. And then I will sign off saying that they have knowledge on this system. Uh, if they don't know some of the things I think that they need to know, I'll give them lookups and tell them to go find those answers and then come back to me before I sign. So uh, they're gonna do that with, like I said, every single system on board. Um, then once they're done, they will do compartment walkthroughs. They're going to go to say engine room lower level with a more senior person. Again, you know, I would qualify for this, but you know, someone qualified the senior watch in that area and that person could walk around and point at anything and say, hey, what is this thing? What is its power supply? What does it do? Um, and they would be expected to know all that stuff for each area each compartment of the submarine before they sit down for their final qualification board uh, at their qual board there's going to be a um, officer there's going to be a senior forward uh, watch stander and a senior aft watch stander uh, who are going to ask them questions and my board uh, lasted about 45 minutes which is kind of on the quicker end uh, of average, usually it's about 45 minutes to an hour. And the very first thing that they had me do is they said, there's a fire in laundry. Uh, what are you gonna do? <laughs> right. Um, so I had to call it away, uh, not for real, of course, but you know, pretend to how I would call it away on the Ford JV, which is the emergency reporting circuit. And then they had me don uh, an emergency air breather, EAB. And they put a uh, those little like surgical cap things that surgeons wear. Uh, they put that over my face while I was wearing that, so I wouldn't be able to see real well. And I had to find my way to laundry from where we were at. Uh, find a fire extinguisher. Pretend like I put out the uh, or sorry, extinguish the power for the uh, dryer, and then use the fire extinguisher to pretend to put out the fire. And then I had to show them where I would get a fire hose if that wasn't enough and how to uh, charge the fire hose and everything. And then uh, we went back to the chief's mess where my board was happening at. And uh, they had me draw the ventilation system and the trim and drain system. And they told me that I had to ventilate the, the ship to get rid of the smoke and dewater the ship to get rid of the water that we used for fighting the fire. And I had to wear the EAB until I was done with that. <laughs> so I had to draw the systems and then explain exactly step by step, you know, how do you align the ventilation system and what can I use and how long is it gonna take and all that stuff to get rid of the smoke. And also, you know, how am I gonna align the trim and drain system and how am I going to get rid of all the water from fighting the fire, so. You know, that was just like the beginning of my board. Well, you, know, and, um, you know, and they could pretty much ask you anything, right? So you'd have yes. to know every possible, or at least come close. And mm -hmm. although I'm sure you you talk to some of your shipmates, like they maybe give you some information what to expect, unless they everybody keeps that like under wraps. Because they don't want to compromise the exercise, which which is good. Um, but it, they could have asked you anything. So you yep. really have to know your stuff. Yeah, because some of the big picture stuff, you know you're going to get asked, like the major systems, major stuff. But they, like you said, can ask anything, any little detail of any system on the entire boat, and you are expected to know about it. Right. Excellent. So cadets, just you know, keep this in mind. Like, 
like when we're doing our training or when you're going to different advanced trainings or even recruit training and the simplest thing like how to precision make your rack right okay because there's an exacting way to do that that's why they train you and they expect you to know these things because when something gets complicated like this if you can't make your rack if you can't put your uniform on right um, what is the likelihood of you being able to fight a submarine fire in the laundry, right? So it's it's all part of the training. Nothing is wasted. Definitely. Okay, um, so kind of got off on a tangent of submarine qualifications there, but on this slide just shows basically what uh, nuclear machinist mates are responsible for is all the piping systems, the turbines, the reduction gears, all that stuff. Um, so basically everything you see on this slide is our main job. Nice. All right. And then uh, next slide. Uh, so things that I work on, turbines, pumps, piping systems, lubrication, hydraulics, and refrigeration. Um, so those are, like I said, the, the main systems. Uh, we use turbines to take the steam from the uh, steam generator and we spin these turbines and we use it to make electricity and we use it to push the ship through the water. Um, we use pumps to, after uh, the steam goes through the turbine, we condense it back down into water and we pump it back into the steam generator so we can reuse it. Um, it's all a closed system. We are able to reuse, like I said, all of that water, um, the piping systems, the valves, all the things in between are, we operate, uh, lubrication systems. We um, are the ones responsible for making sure like the main reduction gears are taken care of, um, hydraulics, uh, not all the hydraulics on the ship are ours, but we handle the hydraulics in the engine room for like steering and diving, mm -hmm. uh, which arguably some of the more important hydraulics because uh, you want to be able to come back to the surface. Uh, yeah, always big. <laughs> uh, we're also uh, responsible for the refrigeration. Uh, well, the air conditioning part, the refrigeration for like food is what they call a gang the auxiliaries division but we handle the um the big air conditioners to keep both the people and the equipment cool okay. um one of the big advantages of submarines is everywhere on the entire boat is air conditioned uh whereas on surface ships only places that need to be air conditioned are air conditioned so right. uh one of the perks um and then I neglected to put it on the slide, but we're also responsible for the high pressure air and low pressure air systems um, that we use for operating like you saw in the video, firing torpedoes uh, all the way to the emergency ballast tanks. We provide the air that we use in case of an emergency to get back to the surface. So pretty big deal. That is a big deal. Um, and then this picture, uh, alas, submarine engine rooms are like classified. So it's actually from a surface ship, but they are repairing a pump. Uh, so unfortunately, none of the pictures are really pictures of, of my job directly. Okay. Well, that, you know. that's fine. I think we, we <laughs> can accept that. All right. Um, so I am ready for the next slide. Then I super briefly mentioned earlier that I am an engineering laboratory technician, ELT. Uh, so we are responsible for some extra stuff on top of regular mechanics stuff. Um, and on submarines, this is considered like a collateral duty that we do in addition to regular machinist mate stuff. Uh, nuclear machinist mates on aircraft carriers will do one or the other. They'll either be just a mechanic or just an ELT. Um, so subs, we get to be both, which has its good and its bad, I suppose. Um, but as ELTs, 
we are responsible for the reactor coolant chemistry, which uh, basically we add chemicals to the water to make sure that the pipes don't corrode, which would cause a leak, which would cause radiation to get where it's not supposed to be. Uh, steam plant chemistry, uh, same basic idea. We're testing the water to make sure that we have the right chemicals that we want in there and we don't have any of the chemicals we don't want in there. Uh, again, main purpose is to prevent corrosion. Uh, radiation controls. So um, we will use our different survey meters and take readings on radiation and make sure that it's within acceptable levels. Um, and then radiation health is kind of our last part of the job. Um, monitoring not only the radiation just for the sake of it, but the reason we care is for the people on board. Um, so we actually have a uh, device called a thermoluminescent dosimeter, or TLD, that measures how much radiation exposure that we receive. And um, we compare that to what you would expect to receive as a normal person living your life and make sure that we aren't getting too much extra exposure. Right. Uh, all, all and super that's for sure. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, you may find it slightly surprising, but the average person gets a lot more exposure to radiation than I did while I was on a nuclear submarine, because most of your radiation exposure comes from the sun and the rocks around you. And on a submarine, there's no sun and there's no rocks around. So, uh, <laughs> all right. The, the average, yeah, the average person gets like 300 uh, millirem of exposure a year on average, and I got 50 millirem over the course of seven years on a submarine. So, okay, that's bragging rights. Yep. Um, and then you know, kind of the last thing with radiation controls, this guy in the yellow suit. Um, the cool thing about being an ELT is most of the time we don't have to dress up in that. We get to make the other people dress up in that and then supervise them doing maintenance and making sure they're not spreading contamination where they're not supposed to. Because um, those things are uncomfortable and hot. So, <laughs> Sure. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's the ELT stuff. Um, move on to the next slide. Uh, favorite things that I've done in the Navy, uh, traveled while I've been in, I've been to 23 different countries, um, all over Europe, some of, uh, the Middle East and Africa, the Caribbean, uh, alas, I've always been stationed on the East coast. So I haven't really been to Asia or Australia much, but, uh, hopefully after I leave here, maybe I'll get stationed out West and get to check some of that stuff out. Um, okay. uh, Always learning, like I said earlier, I like to learn new stuff and there's a lot of things to learn in nuclear power. Um, so there's always new things to, to check out. Uh, incentive pay, uh, one of the perks of being a nuke, it's not an easy job and not everyone can qualify for it, but if you do, they pay you extra. Um, That's good. I got a big signing bonus. Um, Back when I joined, I got $18,000. Now it's like $40,000, but whatever. Uh, not bitter at all. Um, <laughs> now, we're getting, now we're getting to be real money. Cadets, keep that in right. mind. Okay. Yep. Um, and then the first time I re-enlisted, I got a re-enlistment bonus of $90,000. Um, and then they give me, well, when I was new and I wasn't qualified senior in rate, which is your top uh, level of watch. Uh, I got $150 extra a month plus my sub pay uh, extra. And once I qualified uh, engineering watch supervisor, I started getting supervisory pro pay, which is $375 a month uh, on top of my regular pay. So that was nice. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, I guess it kind of goes with traveling, but I've got to try lots of cool new foods, some better than others. Um, did not particularly care for haggis when I was in Scotland. Oh, um, great man. Yeah, uh, well, I, I always try stuff. Um, I had reindeer while I was in Norway, uh, which was fine. 
I had a whale, which I did not like. Um, in Italy, I got to, you know, eat, like, real Italian pizza, which was kind of a, you know, like, it was still good, but it wasn't, it wasn't like American pizza. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, trying the new foods, really enjoyed that. And then, uh, you know, the friends that I made while I've been in, um, you know, now I have friends all over the country, uh, friends in other countries, uh, people who've stayed in, people who got out, you know, so you know people everywhere and you make really close and tight friendships in the name. So I've enjoyed that. Very nice. Uh, and then I think the next slide is the ask me anything. Okay. Uh, that picture there is uh, the Missouri in the dry dock, uh, f- like right before um, commissioning. So that is all of us from the commissioning crew. That is. I have no idea where I am in the picture. <laughs> you're, you're you're the guy in type ones with the hard hat. I got it. Yep. No problem. <laughs> but but I mean just you know it's one of those things to be able to see uh, an attack submarine like that out of the water. You just mm-hmm. get a real sense of you know it's teardrop bullet shape and you know all of that goes into it. Of course, we're not going to look at the uh, propeller. That's something completely different. But right. you know it's it's you know, that thing hold, and is that the entire crew? Um, pretty much. I just just wasn't number. there yet. Um, it was, it was most of the crew though. Um, I can't but, remember exactly uh, what the picture was from, but. Okay. Now the reason I was bringing that up is, I mean, if you take a look, you know, cadets at that amount of people live in that thing underwater, right? It kind of gives you a sense of how compact it is, right? And there's a lot going on there. And how many, how, approximately how many decks are there? How many levels? On a fast attack like I was on, there are three. Um, and then on the guided missile and ballistic missile submarines, there are four decks. Okay. So it looks like it's big, but when you're living in it, it's probably not. That's for sure. Or at least it's it's tight, right? No space is wasted. Yeah, um, they definitely are very creative as far as, you know, there'll be storage lockers wherever they can find a spot for them. Random electronics will be crammed in wherever. Um, right. Because, like you said, there's, there's not much wasted space. So. Excellent. Well, let me read off to you a couple things that have come in from our, our viewers. One of them in particular is from uh, Lieutenant Scott Nobinger from the Flying Tiger Squadron. And he's just uh, sending out, first of all, a hoo to you because one former sea cadet son of his is on the USS Florida. Okay. And another uh, former sea cadet son just graduated MMN Power School. So, oh, nice. uh, so uh, yeah, we... You know, that, I think it's great that, you know, he had the opportunity, uh, you know, Lieutenant Novinger, to, to hear what you're saying and see a little bit of the insides and talk a little bit about that. And clearly he's a, a, a proud member of the Sea Cadet Corps and even a prouder father. So that's fantastic. Um, one of the other questions that cadets like to ask a lot is if you were to sum up your experience of being in the Navy into just a one single word, what word would that be? Ooh, pressure, huh? Oh, that is a lot of pressure. Just one? Uh, just one word. Probably intense. Intense, okay, now explain it. Okay, uh, so it's been intense in different ways. Uh, while I was in training, it was very intense training. Um, we had a lot of work and a lot of stuff that we learned in a short period of time. Uh, operating on submarines is intense because uh, everyone depends on each other so much. And even things that don't seem like they should be that important are that important, like flushing the toilet. You don't think of that as something that could literally kill everyone on the ship. But, uh, and, you know, obviously it's unlikely to get to that point, 
But if you do it wrong, you can realign things so that you're putting seawater into the toilet instead of flushing what's in the toilet out. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it can be intense that way. Um, it can be intense and high pressure and, you know, the, the performance that's expected out of you and those kind of things, like you're on recruiting duty. So that's been pretty much my experience. I would say that the entire time is like, you know, freak out high pressure, you know, all the time, every day, but um, okay. it is, it is. Okay. That's great. Um, let me see. One other question, and and we're going to try to maybe wrap this up a little quicker, folks, because it seems that we're having problems again with your audio. Um, but one question is, what was your impression, like, when you, you first joined, right? You mm -hmm. decided hey, this was the right idea, and then you stepped off the bus at Great Lakes. What went through your head at that moment? Did you know share that with the cadets? Was it like, wow, this is the greatest thing ever, or what was I thinking? And how'd you get over it? So I will actually start with the day before. I was really nervous about going to boot camp, uh, you know, leaving my family, my girlfriend, my my job, everything I knew. And so while I was in the hotel, I couldn't sleep so I read Starship Troopers because okay. I figured the camp scene in that couldn't be any you know like real boot camp could be any worse than that right um, and then I flew up to Chicago I got off the plane and they had me go to the um, USO in the airport there and when I uh, to wait for the shuttle to boot camp and the the lady behind the, the desk when I checked in, she's like, you know, I would take a nap if I were you because you're not sleeping until tomorrow night. And I was like, no, surely she's joking. I was wrong. Uh, but I wasted that valuable time calling my girlfriend um, <laughs> instead of sleeping. And I regretted it because I got to Great Lakes and I was super tired and people are yelling and screaming and, you know, get in line and just I thought what have I done um this is a terrible mistake uh and I will never forget about 4 30 5 o'clock in the morning when our RDC recruit division commander uh when we first met him Petty Officer Ward he was a STS-1 and he walked in with a big bag full of uh those like plastic see-through uh, water bottles uh, and he flung them across the room and they went flying everywhere and it made this horrible noise and he said they say these things are indestructible and I'm going to prove them wrong at the your water bottles recruits and I was just you know like I, I don't even know what to say like I was so shocked at that point so it, it was definitely it was quite, quite the introduction, introduction that's for sure <laughs> So, um, Pastor Mayo, um, on behalf of the Sea Cadets uh, who joined today and those who are going to watch uh, the video replay, I, I do want to thank you very sincerely for taking time today to talk a little bit about your career, what your experiences are like, uh, what it's like uh, being on a nuclear sub and, and all those great things. Uh, thanks to you also for that uh, nice little story about uh, your first introduction to recruit training. Uh, cadets, um, all of it is is done with a purpose. It's made to make you feel uncomfortable and how you can work in a, in a, in a complicated, uh, demanding situation. So therefore, you might as well start getting used to it right off the bat. So induced stress and, and, and continual tiredness is part of the job, right? So that's that's why they, they, they put you through that. So it's for your benefit. You may not know it. But nonetheless, uh, Patty Sermio, again, thank you very much. Truly appreciate getting your insights. Cadets, I hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, I always do um, because and it gives you that view of what it's really like to be in the Navy and everybody's experience is a little bit different. And we have, through this whole series, have met so many interesting and insightful people. And I am very pleased that you've taken your time, cadets, to spend with us learning a little bit more about you know our, our fellow 
sailors and shipmates and hear their sea stories. Uh, one more note again about the online quiz. It will be posted to the uh, video here as soon as we're done with the live broadcast. So it's coming, no problem. Uh, it is slightly different than it has been before in regards to format. So you will get your uh, quiz results right off the bat. So get on there, take the test. Just about everything on the quiz was covered in this presentation. If it's not, use the internet. You know how to use that. You're good at it. Check this out. So it is all open book or open video. So it's no big deal. Do your best uh, and get some credit for uh, attending today. So on behalf of Petty Officer Quinlan, who did a great job in advancing the slides, uh, Petty Officer Lewison, who kept us all up and rolling, um, and again, for Petty Officer Mayo, thank you everybody for joining us. And if you liked the presentation, and I'm sure that you did, smash that like button. We always like that. Tell your friends. We'll be doing it again next time. And join us for the next episode of Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories. Take care, everybody. Have a great evening.